Hey, my name is Spencer Scott. I'm also with Unstoppable Gardening, and our goal is to show you how and to teach you why we must be Unstoppable Gardeners. The presentation tonight is entitled, What in the World Are You Eating? We know, as, we know that the food that we eat is, represents the foundation of who we are. And as medical missionary students and technicians, we understand that there's a tremendous battle that's constructed around the food that we eat. So the title tonight is, What in the World Are You Eating? Let's pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of life that you so abundantly share with us each and every day. We're asking for your presence, Lord, for an understanding and a determination to follow as you lead. Bless us to this end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Revelation 12 and verse 17, the Bible tells us that the dragon that, that the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Because of who the woman was, it made the dragon angry. And as a result, her seed, he declared war with her seed. Our decision initiates this war. And I'm wondering, is there anything that's off limits in war? Of course, I know you say no. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11:6 that without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him must believe that he is, that God is what? That he's an infinite mind that has created all things, loving and kind, but a mind that is infinite, limitless, immeasurable. Perfection after the six days of creation, after the six days of creation said, he looked at what he had created and said it was very good. Every day you remember, he says, at the end of the day, it was good. But perfection declares that his work was very good. And I'm wondering, as children of light, do we really know and do we really believe this, that everything that he made is very good? Is his influence, do we, do we recognize his influence and is his influence clear in our minds when we touch and we see the living systems that he's created. The Bible tells us also that he is a rewarder. So then he's someone that examines, he's a judge that measures our response to his love. Everything that God does is stained with love. You can't remove it. You can't wash it off. Everything is indelibly stained with love. All of his creation was made with us in mind. We're told also that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, examining and rewarding our response to his, his loving kindness. We're told that when the mind is not under direct influence of the Spirit of God, that Satan can mold it as he chooses. All the rational powers of the reasoning and the faculty of reason, reasoning, which he controls, he will carnalize. Otherwise, he will debase it and bring it to its lowest level to gratify either the sensual desires or a worldly mind. If God is not in control, it's predictable which direction that things are going to go. We're told that Satan is directly, openly, immediately fixed to resist 
God in his tastes, in his views, in his preferences, his likes, his dislikes, his choice of pursuits. There is no relish for what God loves or approves. But in, as a matter of fact, but there is a delight in the things which he despises. Lamentations chapter 5 and verse 1 and 2. In a lamentable fashion, he writes, I have given the hand, we have given the hand to the Egyptians and to the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. We've given our power, we've given our means, and we've given our strength to those that hate us, was, was a lamentation that Jeremiah was giving. In Proverbs, we find in 24 and verse 27, we find this written, prepare thy work without and make it fit for thyself in the field, and afterwards build thine house. This counsel is completely opposite of how most go about the choosing and the array of what they put in their homes or how they establish their homes. But God is saying that we should make ourselves, prepare our work outside first and make it fit. If you're choosing to be physically fit and to, and to stay physically fit, you know that it demands an effort and it takes time. Amen? So God is telling us to make ourselves fit in the field first and afterwards then build our house. In commercial agriculture, whether it be field crops or tree crops or legumes or whatever they are, the battle has been set. The war is set. Many growers use what are called harvest aids. These are pre-harvest herbicides to desiccate the weeds and to complete maturing, drying down a certain crop. Because see, when you're growing, typically everything in the field doesn't grow at the same stage because nutrients are less or more in different places. So you have plants that are maturing quicker, some that are maturing slower, and you have a variance in the field, even though things are planted on the same day. Also with the weeds that are present, once the plants come in and they start growing. Most fields are, with pre-emergence today on the commercial side, pre-emergence are keeping the weed pressure down, but still weeds are growing and they're moving along. But now as a way to accelerate the motion, pre-harvest aids are used to dry, to first to kill and then to dry down all the plants. The choice, of course, for large fields, are crop dusters or helicopters because you typically can't get back in to mechanically do it. Now, the goal of desiccants, again, like I said, or harvest aids are to make the crop and the weeds to dry them down to make sure that they're, that they're dry so the combines, when they come in, they can work efficiently. The choices that have been made for desiccants and for harvest aids to dry down are unbelievable. I'm wondering, are any of these things in your pantry? Lentils, barley, oats, flax, triticale? Anybody with kidney beans or black beans or cannelli beans or peas or sunflower in your, in your, uh, in your cabinets, in your pantries? How about non-GMO non -GMO soybeans, corn, rye, millet, potatoes? Probably not sugar beets, but maybe sugar made from these sugar beets and buckwheat. How about maybe non-GMO canola or canola oil, fava beans, cowpeas, chickpeas, lupin beans? Any of these in your pantry? 18.9 billion pounds of glyphosate is used globally. It is one of the most broadly and widely used herbicides around the world. Start made in 1970, 1974, 
It is the widely and most heavily applied weed killer in the history of chemical agriculture. Of course, you know, if you've been following the news and you've been seeing things that have happened in California that glyphosate has been tagged as a carcinogen. It's noted as an endocrine disruptor in human embryonic cells, also the gut flora. It has many implications there in, in, de in destroying the flora in our, in our systems. You must, when the term is given for this product that it is the most widely used herbicide. You have, you, you really have to try to incorporate that around the world. Roundup has many cousins. This product, the primary ingredient, glyphosate. This one, glyphosate. And there are many tools that are very identical to it. There's an independent group that did a study in California of many of the finished products that are in your supermarket that many people purchase day in, day out, day in, day out. And the brands were that they that they went through were just were, were just amazing. Checking for glyphosate residues in the finished product after it had been heated, packaged, ready to go to your table. Most of them had limits that were measurable limits that were far, far beyond the benchmark of what would be quote unquote safe for you to eat poison. Cheerios, Nature Valley products, Kashi brand products, Quaker Oats, Back to nature bars, there were, there were, the list is huge of products that once they're heated and baked and set and ready to eat, which you know, heat degrades many, many things, but still the limits were just far, far over the benchmark. Glyphosate has been one that has, that has been used over and over and over again, and it's and it's we, we find it everywhere as an herbicide. But now there's a newer class of insecticides that that has been on that now is ubiquitous. It also has a world footprint. These are called neonicotinoids. I'm sure you've heard of them. The active ingredient, of course, is nicotine. The imidacloropin, the clodinotide are just a few, but there are many classes of the neonicotinoids. Now, what the neonicotinoids do in the insect's body is it works on the central nervous system, not just affects the nervous system, but the chemical attaches itself to the nerve over acts, overreacts the nerves, brings, cause the insect to become paralyzed and then to die from just the nervous system overreacting, overreacting, just goes into, into spasms and then they, and then they expire. Nicotine is the active ingredients, is the active ingredient in that product. Now, let me go back, I want to go back to that. Neonicotinoids are used as a systemic insecticide. They're applied to the ground. And because they're so highly soluble in water, the plants will pick them up and with that movement, take them into every area of the plant. So that when an insect comes along to consume leaves or to consume portions of the plant, they receive the insecticide and it kills them. The neonicotinoids will stay in the soil for over a thousand days, active, a thousand days. Now, those of you that have in your work with individuals that smoke, you understand the damages that nicotine does, collateral damage it does in the body. 
restricting the arterial vessels, um, causing heart rate to increase, blood, high blood pressure, narrowing of the arteries, etc. Same thing is happening in mammals and, and otherwise. Now, one point that um, I wanted to bring out, since the neonicotinoids stay in the soil for over, a, over two years plus, oftentimes because they're so mobile and so water soluble, collateral plants are picking up the flow of a active and viral insecticide. And as a result, because it's systemic, highly water soluble, as rain events happen, as this material will move from its target location, other plants pick it up, it goes into their flowers and stems and nectars and so forth. Neonicotinoids are implicated as being one of the highest reasons why our bee populations have been diminished as well as other beneficial insects because as they go to another flower to pollinate, they're picking up this poison and because their bodies are so small, they can't handle the flow of the poisons. But now when these products are used in your vegetables and they're used in fruit, mobile, water soluble, going to every piece, every section and area of the plant the damage as written on the label and as written in publications is not as effective in the human being or damaging in the human being or other larger mammals as it is in the insect because the volumes are smaller, but yet we're not receiving applications twice a year, three times a season, four times a season, five times a season we're eating every day. Every day, if you're not consuming organic products, and if you've settled for the non-GMO products, whether they're organic or not, the same work is going on in the fields. The same insecticides are being employed to do the work of remediating insect pressure. So in micro amounts, these poisons are coming into the system. And all of you know with nicotine, with its potency, just a very, very, very little amount of nicotine is needed to arrest a large mammal as well as a human being. Because this works on the central nervous system of the body, which is the, which is the brain and the spinal cord, we can praise the Lord that we don't use all of our mental capacities, but then you must understand also when you read in your Bible and the scripture tells us that Satan speaking about the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And when you examine the word subtle, it describes to us something that you can look at analyze and you cannot even explain it because the variance is so, so subtle. The difference, the trajectory of two things moving alongside each other at targeted and focused on different destinations while they're together and while they're moving along side by side, you can't see the variance and or the movement in opposite directions, subtle. Our mind is where all the activity of the body stems from. And when you examine, when you examine the diseases of the central nervous system, they, if the list is long and it's huge. And if we wonder why there are so many illnesses, there's so many diseases, there's so many chronic conditions, the food has been set as the battleground. Let's 
see if we can advance to the next slide. Right. Um, okay, my computer's not cooperating. That's okay. Um, also, along with the insecticides that, with the neonicotinoids that are, that are have been flushed through the the world. In, in their usage, along with the glyphosate, there are other compounds that are used day in and day out and day in and day out. We have to recognize that we're in a global, we do recognize that we're in a global economy. Fruits and vegetables in some of our supermarkets are coming from over 160 different countries around the world where organic regulations, may or may not be policed, if you want to use that word, or evaluated or monitored or kept in check as they would be in a more regulated environment. China has four times the amount of organic crop production than the United States does, and it's growing. Most of their farmers, it is said, earn about $2,000 a year, small farms. The water supplies of the Yangtze River, at least, more, they said more than 30% of the water supply from their records is deemed unsuitable for use in farms. Most of the 80% of the untreated sewage flows into the two major rivers that, that flow through China. And as resultingly, human fecal matter, because it is so abundant and there's so few places to, for it to be managed, is used as the primary fertilizer for crops and for food. The garlic production in China is, is, is huge. Volumes and volumes of this product finds itself repacked, sitting on your shelf, bleached white to be available for consumption, either peeled or fresh. There's a worldwide movement in the food industry to use and to promote sewer sludge and the human excrement, whether it be the urine or the feces, to use this material for the value that it has in nitrogen and in ammonium. In fact, there's a moving lobby that's, that's, that's being conducted here in the United States to use more of this product in the production of crops, in the production of food, to reduce the bottom line cost for fertilizers. Brother Spencer? Yes. Someone, they really want to see your slide and someone has asked for us to stop and pray. Okay. Um, Brother Carlos, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, they're saying that he has to go back into the screen, but let us pray first. Carlos, can you pray for us, please? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the information that we have received thus far. Thank you for the presenters, the speakers, and everyone who is present. Lord, at this time, we ask, Father, that you please be with the technology as we need these uh, resources in order to communicate this powerful information. So please, Lord, remove any obstacles, any hindrances that, that could uh, prohibit your message from going forward. I pray, Lord, for a special blessing 
upon the speaker and upon the information that he's presenting, Lord, remove all hindrance, all hindrances. We ask you, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Okay, so someone in the chat room said that he has to um, try going back into his slideshow slideshow app. Okay. I don't know what that means. All right, let me try. Um, I'm sure that I'm. I, I fail to be as proficient as I could be with these with these tools. There, that's a challenge. Okay, let's see if I can advance now. Okay, so someone else said he can stop screen share and start again, but it's moving now, right? Are you moving now? Okay. So again, the question comes back as we started, what in the world are we eating? As a commercial grower, had the privilege of, of dealing with agriculture here in the United States as well as overseas and interacting with some of the largest worldwide companies here in the United States through oftentimes field meetings with their, with their farmers, with their growers, because a lot of national companies have a lot of growers that do growing for them, interacting with their growers, interacting with the management staff, on growing practices and sunlight enhancement for crops, et cetera, et cetera. But it's disconcerting to see the, I wanna say the indifference when it comes to the organic side of growing versus the conventional side of growing in a capitalist market, the organic side of the market represents a price point change with a interruption in practices that have been carried on for centuries. So many that come into it in a regulated system, especially for small growers and small farmers, they're trying to imbibe those principles, to use those principles of soil building and in the absence of chemical, synthesized chemical products into their field so that they can present to their buyers and to their farmers markets, et cetera, a product that is superior to the conventional tools that have been used. But in a national system and in a worldwide system, I want you to understand that there's not a central agency that has staff or people to go from place to place to place to hold feet to the fire when it comes to honor and, and keeping things in alignment with program goals and with everything else that surrounds it. Because you have third party individuals that come through to, to evaluate and to monitor in their established companies are focused on their bottom line also. It adds room for distortion of value, distortion of practices. We were invited to grow what we eat. But most of us, when we consider it, it's like, how in the world can I grow everything that I'm going to eat? How do I do it? I don't have that much land. And many don't have that experience either. 
I'm going to challenge you that if we don't start managing the food that we're eating, we're going to be in the same position as those that we must minister to. Satan is doing his work in taking soldiers off the field through the food that we consume. And you don't fall over the first year that you eat it, or maybe the second year that you eat it. It is a very insidious, creeping, slow-moving work that's being done, and the load is being put on the kidneys, load is being put on the liver to metabolize and to work with the poisons that are coming through in micro amounts, but the the load is nevertheless the same. If we say we're family and we're living as we're family, then three and four families, if they got together and said, listen, Robert, you grow the beans and Paul, you do the corn and the potatoes. And Alice, you do the squash and the greens. And somebody else takes the load on the tomatoes and the other products that are grown. And all of all four groups, all four families working toward a harvest at the end of the year. If Robert has to leave and be gone for a month, no problem. The other three in the group pick up his slack because the goal is harvest. We must turn our attention to the destiny that's set in front of us that we, if we're choosing to obey the Lord, if we're choosing to be obedient, our course and our direction is set in front of us. And we've already been told what's at the end of the book. We've already been told what's what the last pages look like. I want to encourage you to move in that direction. We're planning a hands-on event in agriculture, in greenhousing, in building, in everything that it takes to break free of the chain of the purchasing that we're that we've enjoyed for years commercially because as many of you know that there will be no announcement when it's cut off but it's determined to be cut off so how many are preparing and and are ready for that switch to be turned off If the Lord would will, we would like to do two or three or four conferences in different places of the United States to tool you with what you need to practically be able to do it. All the trades are practical. You must put your hands in it. You must do it. But we want, our goal is that you do it proficiently. At Unstoppable Gardening, we want to show you how, and we want to teach you why it is critical. This presentation was just a splash of the reasons why. But we have a loving, merciful, patient, and kind creator that strives day after day after day with us because he loves us desperately and wants us to miss the damage that is being done. Sin is predictable and we must understand the predictability in the, in the, in the area that any time a human being has turned his mind and his thoughts away from his creator. The living systems that, that, he's, that, the, that God has made, he will not be in tune with them. 
He will manipulate them and he will use them for purposes that are not beneficial to the end users. And we see that over and over and over again as we look through the landscape of agriculture and farming and ranching. Brothers and sisters, be encouraged and you must become unstoppable gardeners by God's grace. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Brother Spencer. It's a great presentation. So um, I'm hoping that everyone has truly learned what has been taught here because this is allowing us to open our eyes and see exactly what's happening. It says, the scripture says that we, there's spiritual wickedness in high places. So we're gonna go ahead and Carlos, are you tired? <laughs> Who's not tired? No, I'm, so, I'm golden. You're golden, great, good. Okay, so go ahead, Carlos, and take the, the hands for us and just one question at a time, everyone. All right, let me uh, just remove the share screen so I can see everyone's hands. Um, in the meantime, let's go ahead and take questions. Uh, let's see here. All right, so we have Veronica. Go ahead and ask your question. The floor is yours. Good evening. Um, my question, Brother Scott, is... Um, I have two questions, but I'll get back in line. Um, my first question is when you, when I've watched or learned from other persons that are more experienced with food, they speak about soaking your, your food in um, sea salt or vinegar with water. Um, does that, is that only cleaning off the exterior or is that helping in an additional way with these other pesticides and stuff? Cause I'm just concerned. I'm just like, well, I don't know how for the things that you eat the skin of, they say to do that. Um, what are you, what are your thoughts on that? Anytime you do a surface wash, it's, it's going to remove the contaminants that set on the surface. For any of the systemic products, they are flowing through the exylum, they're flowing through the system of the plant and have lodged themselves in the fiber and have lodged themselves in the interior of the vegetable and the fruit that you eat. It's not possible to wash those things off. As you will remember and consider the E. coli and salmonella outbreaks, plants don't have a firewall. So they will receive what's in the soil and pull it into their systems. And as it's lodging there and we wash the dirt and other things off and consume it, it's, it's, uh, it's the, back, the bacteria are waiting. Awesome. All right, let's go with DD. I'm just gonna pronounce those first two letters because I don't, I don't want to butcher anything. So go ahead, uh, ask your question. All right. Can you hear me? Yep. All right, great. Thank you. Um, so I'm familiar with some uh, some of your work, and uh, thank you for all the good work that you've been putting out there. Um, my question is, um, I know you've spoke about like chlorine and the, the effects of that on the soil and what have you. Uh, I'm wondering if you've done any research on uh, uranium and understanding, because I, I know a lot of times it goes into the leaves and is able, you know, it concentrates over there. So twofold, the question is, it seems like it should be okay for your trees and when you're watering your trees. And because the fruits will not take it, the leaves will take it. But then the next part is in your vegetables and how much uranium would be safe. Now, I'm not sure if you've done any research on this area. 
I have not done any research on uranium specifically, but heavy metals, yes. In fact, um, with the heavy metals, you if you remember following some of the court cases that were in California, where Del Monte and Dole and some of the larger companies were being brought to task for the, the heavy oxidized lead levels that were in fruit. And each, each side was crying foul because of the volumes and the measurable limits, wanting to play with those numbers, et cetera, et cetera. But heavy metals, they will move into plants and they will find themselves into their finished products, their seed, their seed, their seeded, uh, their seeded products, which, which would be the fruit or otherwise. Great, let's have Stacy with your question. The floor is yours. Thank you, and thanks for that presentation, um, uh, Mr. Scott, Brother Scott. I wanted to ask, on um, these workshops that you mentioned, um, when will you be hosting those and where? The first workshop is set to be in the Florida area um, in at Camp Colacqua. Um, I think, uh, I think our host has, a, has a, a note that she'll put up later for it, but the first one will be in the Florida area. So those of you that are within that region, um, it's let us know um, and we'll get the details to you through this, uh, through MM Healthline. So they can, you'll be able to know when it is, what the costs are, et cetera, et cetera and what the what will be presented yeah and i do have that um that informational page that i'll be posting shortly probably at the end of the question so that no one's distracted and uh everybody can probably uh, screenshot it all right let's have stay uh was it stacy that just asked her question I don't, i'm not sure yeah. no i don't it was okay all right <laughs> okay thanks stacy all right uh, let's go with Mar Marta. Hi. Um, at the beginning, you had mentioned a study about the cereals and the uh, pesticides, but it didn't show the author or where you could find that study, so you could, so we could read up on it. Is there any way we you, we could yep. get yeah, that information? Yeah, go to. Yep, e, I think it's EWG is the uh, is one of the um, independent companies that Google just um, just 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 Google um, glyphosate in, in in cereals. Do that search, and EWG is one of the one of the uh, nonprofits that that conducted a study a few years back, and then they came back again in 2019 to review. A Again, but you'll be able to find um, that research on the web. All right, let's go with Carol. Carol, are you able to unmute your mic? Can you hear me? I heard you briefly. Try it again. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay, great. I am so excited to be a participant. Thank you, Gwen Shorter. Um, Brother Spencer, I have three questions. Well, I, I, not really three questions. Just one wrapped into three. I have always been under the impression by listening to others speak like avocados or walnuts. And I hear people say, well, because of the skin, the tough skin of the avocado or the shell of the walnut, it doesn't have to be organic. Hello, sis. Hello, sis. You have a, lot, you of, you, you have a lot of background noise. Oh, I'm sorry. To, Forgive yeah. me. My family's to listen to the Messiah. I apologize. Okay. okay. I'm going far, far away. Okay. Forgive yeah, me. You. I'm thank so you. sorry. Okay. okay. Let me start from the top. Avocados, tough skin. Walnuts, tough shell. Must they be organic to get the optimum health benefits? And 
avoid the negative. Can you hear me? We hear you, okay. I think. It's, uh, okay, go ahead. Um, I, I guess remember that organic defines the use. It's a, it's a cultural practice. Does it define the use of the materials are, that are given to plants? Human feces is organic. Blood meal is organic. Vet guano is organic. It has a certified tag by Omri for the use in organic production. Maybe that some of those products that you, as your understanding increases, you may or may not want to use in your food. But it yet in the same will fit an organic label. In some countries, here, um, the sewer sludge has not, been, has not been one that's approved as yet, but other places, it, it's there. So pesticide-free and farmed with the best practices that, that are compatible to good health should be the benchmark for the organic and for, and for choosing what I apply to the trees, what I apply to the plants, et cetera. Okay, so I'm sorry, I had to jump in here um, because mm -hmm. you said that sludge practicing is not um, approved in the United States. But can you explain what is biosolids? Okay. Biosolids is exactly that. The biosolids is the remnant of the fecal matter that has that, that builds up from day to day to day to day to day in every city of the United States. And the pressure to release that product and to move it into areas where it can be, it can be, it can be dissipated is a task that is set to almost every municipality. It is, you can find it bagged and incorporated in your potting mixes. You can purchase it on its own as an activated biosolid. But typically with the employment of it, there are wide bursts of time that are asked to apply it and let the ground set, whether it be 300 days or 400 days or 500 days before it's planted into. I know that the affluent is used on many fields for fodder for animals, for hay and, and triticale and different things that are cut, oats that are cut and then, and then baled. There's, if it's going for animal production, I think the door's wide open. When it comes to using it in the United States, I'm speak, speaking specifically here, when it comes to using it here, even on the conventional side, there is some hesitancy, there's some slowness to plant right into it. So from an organic standpoint, because of the fecal coliform, because of those levels and the fear that supermarkets have of foodborne illnesses and, 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 and so forth, not wanting their name to be bludgeoned in the community, there's a, there's a major pushback on that side of the fence. But, but the soldiers are working hard to, to figure out how in the world we can get this into the mainstream because the volume is unbelievable. Okay, let's have Veronica and Williams with your question. Hi, my question was, <clears throat> Um, how it's interesting that you referenced the um, EWG because I, you know, recently looked up the infamous, you know, clean 15 and dirty dozen. And I was a little confused because 
what I understood is that the dirty dozen means that those things you should prioritize as only eating organic because they are highly sprayed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to speak to non-GMO because I'm not sure about that. I know that organic doesn't mean non-GMO and I, that's all I understand. Maybe you can speak to that. But the clean 15 is my question. The clean 15 list in the order that they have it is avocado, then sweet corn, and that lists other things. And then it has this blurb, small amount of sweet corn, papaya, and summer squash. All of those things are on the clean 15 list. Uh, sold in the U.S. is produced from genetically modified seeds. Buy organic varieties of these crops if you want to avoid genetically modified produce. And that's from the Environmental Working Group. My question is, I, I don't understand how, I thought the clean 15 were, you can eat it whether it's organic or not, because it's not likely to be sprayed. But I understood that soy, corn, and wheat are highly GMO. So can you help me understand that? Because I'm confused there because I love corn, but I stopped eating it unless I knew it was organic. Now I'm realizing that doesn't mean that it wasn't. No, organic does mean that it was not sprayed. Okay. Help. Can you help me, please? Sure. The, the Clean 15 was, was, was initiated because of the reduced impact of the management of insects and fungicides and the herbicide abatement that would happen in the orchards and amongst the plants. Because, they, because there's a hard shell and as spraying would happen, the encased product that's eaten would, would have less impact and absorption of the chemicals that were applied. So that's where the benchmark was set with the Clean 15. The impact was minimized to a point that, hey, you know, you, you, you could go with that and, and, and probably be okay. Um, remember, for many, and for those that are on message with the recombining of genes and genetic modification in on that side of the fence, genetic modification isn't a problem. Gene recombination isn't a problem. In fact, it's that the thesis is it's better for the world. So you, you'll find that blending of ideology and philosophy in the choosing and in the formulation of what's presented as suspect and what's presented as green light, move forward with it. Okay. Uh, brother, Fred is really quiet on this issue. I know he likes gardening. I don't know where he is right now. Okay. Um, we're going to go ahead and we're just going to allow the last three questions to go forward. All right. Uh, thank you for your question, Veronica. Let's have Patty's iPad. Go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. This might not be your area, but I was just curious because I had never heard of those neonicotinoids. I'm pretty, pretty familiar and educated on the glyphosates and I'm very surprised to hear about this. Um, so I'm definitely going to research it more, but I don't know if there's anything that you know of, because we're getting ready. We have gardens and we're in the country and we're getting ready to get some beehives. Is there anything that we can do to keep the bees safe from these chemicals that seem to be killing them off? Because bees have a, um, a birth of travel that I think is three miles or better. Um, mm -hmm. 
monitor what's, you know, what's going on in your area. And if you've got lots of flowers and they can be, they can be overwintered where there's, and even during the season where there's a lot of activity, a lot of flowers for them to work, um, you may not, they may not have to do so much traveling to find the nectars and to find the, the, um, the flowers pollens to to come back and, and, and do their, their honey production. Very good. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Awesome. Let's have V35. Go ahead and ask your question. Okay. All I wanted to say, can you hear me? I can hear you well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all I wanted to say was nothing is really organic unless you grow it yourself. Well, when, when you're managing things, you're, you're managing things yourself, your safety, the safety of the product um, has to accelerate. It has to, those, that bar has to go way, way up. It has to, it, it really has to be better. I think that's the whole point. The more we can manage ourselves, the better, the better off we're going to be um, in using the best products possible. Okay, so thank you, V35, for your for your uh, comment or question. <laughs> Was that was that it? Was that your question, or did you have something uh, an actual question? I'm not sure if that was a. I think she's done. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's have um, Roxanne. Sorry, Lisa. This was the last question we were taking. So uh, um, unless there's a little bit more, unless this one's asked quickly, I'm not sure. But um, Lisa, I see your hand raised, but we won't be able to take yours. But uh, go ahead and uh, ask your question, Roxanne. to grow our, our own garden so what is the best way to eat until then until we're able to you know produce our own food well get to know your local growers that are around you get to know the get to know their the local organic farms that are in your area many of them have open arms for people to come in and visit or there's time set for that. Or if you go to the farmer's markets, get to know some of the growers that are there. Talk to them about how they grow, what they use, what they do until you get a comfort, comfort level with um, the growers and what the farms they are. They really want their customers to, to know who they are. They're proud of, many of them are very proud of what they do. And there's some great small farms that are, they're doing an, an ex excellent job in growing product. The, the difficulty is that because they're small farms, very few have enough product to flush into the big markets. So you don't see the, you don't see their work sometimes in the supermarket. Sometimes you do, depending on where you are. Okay, we're going to go ahead and take Lisa Live. Lisa Live. Lisa Live. Lisa Live. <laughs> Where's your brother? Huh? What'd you do with your brother? Okay. So, um, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right. Okay, great. Um, I did have one last question. Um, so um, last year I was able to um, purchase some organic soil from a local nursery um, mm -hmm. where they kind of give you like a, I guess it gives you like almost like a write-up in regards to the soil content of what it's made up from. But how can you trust that? Like what's the best place that you can kind of source for really good, rich, pure organic soil? Um, that, that 
can present a challenge depending on where you depending on where you are, and even um, it just it presents a challenge because what what many label as garden soil it it's going to it's going to vary as minds and, and, and thought processes vary. We sometimes we you've got to travel and touch and look and talk to and ask questions and. And, and, and go through that process of whittling down, whittling down until you actually find a soil that has actively decomposing compost in it. And a soil that, that's not labored with probably some of the things that maybe you wouldn't want to. If you're a veganic grower and you don't want the animal products in it, that is going to narrow your your list even tighter but it's there they're there from 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 place to place but it's it's a challenge to find it awesome awesome very quickly um before Raina, before you jump in i just want i just want to um give a small exhortation to everyone on the line i'm sure if everyone's mic was unmuted and i asked you how many of us were blessed today everyone would quickly just say, say some kind of a testimony. I know I was blessed. And if you were blessed, if you guys would consider uh, donating a small $5 or whatever the Lord impresses upon your heart to um, Cash App, MM Healthline, or even PayPal, um, mmhealthline at gmail.com. This is not something that um, these, these Zoom meetings are free and they're open for everyone. So there's no expenses for you to be on. But if you are blessed and you would like more of this work, um, then why don't you go ahead and grease the wheels to make it uh, possible for, for Sister Raina to put more of these meetings together and to also bless the speakers who, who come on and, and, and sacrifice of their time to bless us all with this information. So I'm going to put in the chat uh, the Cash App and the PayPal that you can submit your, your loving donations to. It doesn't have to be $5. It can be less. It can be more. Whatever the Lord impresses upon your heart. And um, I know God will bless you for your generosity. And we want to bless uh, those who bless us. And we know Raina has taken so much of her time and so as, as well as these speakers to make this possible for us. So just I wanted to leave that exhortation with all of you. And I have been blessed as well. So thank you guys for hearing me out. And uh, Raina, the floor is yours. Amen. Okay. Thank you so much to everyone um, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Brother Spencer. Um, <laughs> Carlos, do you have the flyer? We're going to put up the flyer, I guess. Yep, I do. I'm going to share my screen right now. Okay. So, but there are questions in the chat. I, I, you guys, I'm so tired. <laughs> I can't see all of that stuff. All I know is that the chat just keeps going up. Um, do you see the flyer? I do see it. Okay. I do see it. So, um, who? So here, here you go, guys. This is what uh, this is what uh, Brother Spencer was uh, mentioning. Uh, correct, Brother Spencer. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, if you guys would like to screenshot it, I don't know if Spencer, if there's anything you. Want to the, 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 you're buffering a little, bit, Brother Spencer. Conference and. It's, look at the dates, um, very shortly we'll have a program for you so that you'll see all the different activities that will happen during those four days. It's going to be a compressed, packed program that you'll, you'll be able to use, you'll be able to apply your hands to whatever is going on. We will send you back with volumes of material to review as you go back to your various places to review and then try to be available for the questions, try to be available for whatever tutorials that you need along the way. But we want to arm you with all the tools that you need to be successful and to be an unstoppable gardener. <laughs>